Welcome back chess friends, this is the match one summary of the 1834 unofficial World Chess Championship and to do this I'm going to use this book that I found from 1850 called Chess and Chess Players consisting of original stories and sketches by George Walker. Um, I'm using this because it's got a whole chapter about Le Bourdonnais and Macdonald and the matches that they played and it's all very interesting. So um, let's go to the chapter. The Battles of Macdonald and Della Bourdonnais. This paper was first published in the Chess Players Chronicle 1843. So I've already been through the pages and I've highlighted the bits that I'm going to read out to you, but you can pause the video at any time and just read all the all the uh, extra detail if you wish. There's also a bit of French in here and because I can speak a little bit of French, I'll do the translation as we go. So um, let's just click through. You can pause this if you want to read it in full. And we get to the first bit that I want to read out. So. On the arrival of the Gallic Paladin, everyone was of course anxious to make a match between these mighty compeers. Macdonald declared himself ready to play upon any terms and in any manner. He was avowedly the only Englishman prepared to measure himself with the French chief. A match of 21 games, exclusive, exclusive of drawn games, was arranged to be played by these two rivals for fame. This match was not lightly or easily adjusted, many details being to be settled. The kind assistance of Mr. Greenwood Walker at length smoothed down all obstacles and placed the parties via V at the chessboard. A, wo a word on the Mr. Walker here quoted. Mr. William Greenwood Walker, himself but a very moderate chess player, related to me only in name, was the most enthusiastic chess recorder I have ever had the honour to know. He cared little to play himself, but delighted to be always at Madonna's elbow to record his victory, like one of the bards of old ever by the side of his chief, to him the song of triumph in his praise. When the game ran in Madonna's favour, Mr. Walker's features were lighted up into a smile of benignity. When fortune frowned on his hero, and she would frown sometimes, particularly when the rival who courted her favours was Le Bourdonnais, Mr. Walker looked, I will not say daggers, but assuredly pitchforks on the ghoul, and on all around who appeared to sympathise with France. Fair. It is worth noticing that in the playing of important matches, care should be taken to prevent spectators from pressing closely around the players. A space should be roped off with a silk cord or some other protector, and the naturally anxious friends of the parties should, with certain necessary exceptions, be content to watch the progress of the game on a duplicate chessboard in another room. During the first games played by Della Bourdonnais and Macdonald, the latter especially suffered from the very inconsiderate crowding around of spectators, to which Della Bourdonnais was comparatively indifferent, from the circumstance of having been more accustomed to the, very accompaniment, to the varied accompaniments and forms of sound with chess. I recollect personally witnessing the entree once of one of my dear countrymen into the club room while Macdonald and Della Bourdonnais were engaged in one of their most trying positions. Our friend first shook hands with each of them, and then thrusting his figure between them, took a deliberate survey of the board, resting with his two hands in the middle of the pieces. However, after merely half a dozen questions such as, Is this your first game today? That rook seems in the devil's own mess. And whose move is it? He suffered the game kindly to proceed, for which the parties felt doubtless due obligation. The first match then was made between Della Bourdonnais and Macdonald of 21 games. All the games to be played out exclusive of draws, and the two candidates for chess honours sat down to their first game in the presence of a large concourse of amateurs. The scene of action being the Westminster Club. The match commenced in June and was finished during July 1834. The combatants generally met around 12 or 1 o'clock and played till 6 or 7, several times adjourning a game till next meeting. They played nearly every day, Sundays excepted. Many of the games lasted long, long hours, but the exact time of duration of each was not noted down. I have seen Macdonald an hour and a half and even more upon one move, and I once timed Le Bourdonnais 55 minutes. Macdonald was incomparably the slower player, consuming, I calculated on an average, three-fourths, or very nearly so, of the whole time occupied on his own moves. He was uniformly tranquil, patient, good-tempered and silent, whether studying his own move or awaiting his turn to play. His adversary, on the other hand, with the mercurial temperament of his lively country, talked and laughed a good deal at intervals when winning, and swore tolerably round oaths in a pretty audible voice when fate ran counter to his schemes. Le Bourdonnais also lost temper occasionally under the protracted calculations of his cooler adversary, and expressed his dislike at the great time they occupied by sundry very plain gestures and shrugs. As Le Bourdonnais spoke no English and Macdonald no French, 
we may safely take it they had little conversation together. The word check was, I believe, nearly the sole phrase that ever passed between them. Mate, being seldom waited for, or when given, expressed simply by a friendly smile. Rochefoucauld well says that in the misfortunes of our best friends there is something not unpleasing to us. Rochefoucauld must have been a chess player. The move in the first game was cast lots for, and won by Delabordne. The game was drawn after a most arduous struggle. According to the English law, a drawn game being no game in certain respects, Delabordne again played first. The second game was drawn. The third game was drawn. And in each of these three games, the French champion had attacked with what we term the Queen's Pawn 2 opening, in different modifications. The parties rested on their arms, and the interest of friends naturally increased as to the future. These games had each lasted nearly 60 moves of very unusual length. MacDonald's friends began to think Delabordne had been overrated, and MacDonald himself told me at this point that whereas he had been nervous at the commencement of the match, he now felt confident of ultimate success. Delabordne has had the move, said he, each time, and yet has done nothing. When the move is mine, I am able to attack with my bishop's gambit and Evans' game, then you'll see. But perhaps he may play king's pawn one, remarked a bystander. MacDonald replied that he wished this, as he had a new mode of manoeuvring to meet that debut, adding that win or lose, nothing should tempt him himself to play so dry a game as King's Pawn 1, and this he ever most nobly and gallantly persisted in. Le Bourdonnais, on his part, appeared to be staggered and surprised at his vivid attacks having been so completely foiled. MacDonald is the greatest player I ever encountered, said he to me, but patience onion begets. The fourth game, Della Bordene opened on Giocco Piano, caught his adversary at a disadvantage, brought up all his force of skill to the calculation, and mated MacDonald on the 31st move. Onion begets my berry, laughed the ghoul. But MacDonald won the fifth and sixth games, and was thus the victor on the first half dozen parties of the match. Too much detail were tedious. Della Bordene threw his whole soul into the struggle, and of the 21 games comprising the first match, won no less than 16 to 5. Other four games were drawn, making the total number played in this match 25. The friends of MacDonald were, however, far more dismayed at the great disparity at the close than was he himself. He frankly told me he considered the Frenchman the better player, but believed his own powers were sufficient to come up with him in time. A great number of the games in this match consisted of Queen's Gambits, played by Della Bordene, in which MacDonald persisted, most erroneously, in taking the offered Gambit pawn and thus exposing himself needlessly to a murderous attack. With the powers of genius, he possessed also its firmness, amounting too often to mere obstinacy. Nothing could induce him to evade the Queen's Gambit. It is worthy of remark that MacDonald introduced his Bishop's Gambit three times during the match and always lost it. Delabordne was the first to show us that the real defence of this game turns on second players not regarding the being compelled to move his king to the Queen's Square at a certain point of the opening. And here Mr. Walker references correspondence between MacDonald and himself related to the King's Pawn 1 game that we went through in a previous video. So if you want all those details, I'll, I'll link it down in the description and you can enjoy that at your leisure. But we continue here. Reference to the games themselves will best prove the fallacy in which MacDonald indulged as to the King's Pawn 1 game. He has struck out a sort of pet scheme from which nothing could induce him to depart. Too late, MacDonald gave way to the counsel of his friends, and we find him finally shaping the King's Pawn one game so as to come fully equal out of the opening. I am far from seeking to detract from the fame of Della Bordene, and honestly believe him to have been the stronger player of the two. Yet, if we deduct from the score the Queen's Gambits and King's Pawn one games, in which MacDonald, though persisting in risking openings rotten for him at their very cause, gave away graciously an advantage fully equal to a pawn. I say, deduct all such from the reckoning, and the balance would show quite a different figure. In comparing the two players, it is quite fair to dwell upon this point. The match was, however, over, and our champion fairly beaten. The way in which MacDonald met his defeat was to demand his revenge, and a second match was instantly made, to consist of nine games exclusive of draws. The second match was played in July 1834. In fact, I may state once for all that the various matches I am about to enumerate, of which the one celebrated war was composed, were all contested during the summer and autumn of 1834. Well, that was highly entertaining. Um, thank you for joining me for this read-through and summary of match one, and I'll see you again next time.